you very much. So uh, just to clarify a little further, so um, I'm, I'm uh, I suppose you would say a film person rather than music person. I actually lecture in film production at the University of Leeds. And I think I need to say right at the outset, in case you want to just go somewhere else, is that the, the, the interactive documentary part of it was really what Graham was going to do, and I can't really kind of deliver his slot for him. I was involved in the making of this documentary at the centre of this. But I can certainly you know, answer questions about the, the plan for the interactive, doc, interactive documentary and where this project is going. If you're feeling crestfallen that, you know, that I'm really doing more about this particular central film rather than interactive documentary, then there may be something left here if you're interested remotely at all in The Clash, because the, the, the film is at, at the centre of this. It's a pretty rare piece of, of kind of controversial Clash history, and it's the very, very, very last days of The Clash, effectively, the, the last things they ever did. So, to, ex to explain, um, the interactive documentary is kind of offline at the moment, we'll, we'll be going back on, but it comes from, from this. Um, you may recognize the kind of paraphrasing of a rather classic old Hollywood movie. And this actually stems from uh, my uh, youth, later youth, because it's, it's an event that I kind of sat on for years when um, my younger sister's best friend stumbled into the bar one night with this rather incredible story um, in that she was at Glasgow School of Art, um, possibly ducking out of class, I don't know, um, having a beer when these guys came into this uh, bar in Glasgow called Nikos, uh, and who looked, as she, as she says, uh, like someone. Um, and uh, she spent some time with them. I, I'm, I, I want to let the documentary speak for itself, and it actually speaks for itself in the text at the moment. I sat on the project for quite a while because what worried me was the story was great, um, and yet there was very, very limited visual material. Uh, the very nature of the thing, unannounced, on the road, busking without a plan or a map, and of course this was not in the era of mobile phones. Uh, there was very, very little visual material, uh, except some rather magical uh, magical photographs that Gillian took, having just remembered at the very last minute that she had a roll of 36 black and white in her, in her, um, in her SLR. Um, so the film is about 17 and a half minutes long, and uh, but she, makes, she makes a good storyteller, but I think unless you've got any questions beforehand, I should just let the film uh, play and speak for itself, and then maybe pick up some questions at the end. Because I can talk more about this, the busking tour. Can I ask, is anyone here aware of the, the Clash busking tour? I can, I can certainly explain that, but um, here's the story. The audio is as high as it goes. So it was um, a Wednesday evening. I was down here with two of my friends from art school and we were just sitting here having a, a half a pint or whatever it was and, uh, and in they walked. And, uh, and I just the first thing that I thought was, wow, look at these guys, they look like they're someone. They were all dressed in the black leathers and they had the guitars with them. And, uh, it was obvious that you know they weren't just a, a busking band off the street, that they were somebody a bit special. And then as I was looking, you know, I, I, I recognised Trummer's face, but I was thrown by the fact that his hair was dyed red at the time. Uh, but I was looking and then I looked across and I saw Simon and I thought, I'd know that face anywhere. That is Paul Simonon. And then I looked back at Strummer and I heard him speaking and as soon as I heard his voice I thought, oh my god, this is the clash, it's the clash, the clash I hear and Nikos have just walked into my life. Um, and so from that point then I thought, oh I really have to get an autograph. Um, so I, I, I plucked up the courage eventually to, 
to tap Strummer on the shoulder and he turned round and uh, asked for his autograph and uh, he very coolly said, sorry, we don't do that. And, uh, and so I felt really embarrassed and he said, ask him. And uh, so I got chatting to one of the other guys, I think it was Vince, and I, and I said to him, um, so what is it you're doing? And he explained that they were bringing out this album, that they were um, just trying to get back to the roots by doing a busking tour around Britain. Uh, and I said, well, you must be staying somewhere really amazing. And he said, actually, no, but we don't know where we're staying yet. We're just going to stay with anybody that will put us up. And of course, quick as a flash, I said, stay fine if you like, not expecting for a second that they would actually say, well, that would be really cool. But then Vince turned around to Strummer and said, oi, Joe, we've got a crash for the night. And uh, well, you can imagine the phone call, phone in my flatmate and saying, uh, Claire, I'm in Nico's. The Clash have just walked in and you'll need to tidy up because they're coming back to stay tonight. <laughs> We're on Highland Road now. We are. Which is uh, yep. where your flat was in Yes, indeed, in 1985. This is where I was living. We piled into the flat and uh, remember it's the, the complete disbelief on Claire's face when I walked in with her and she thought, oh my God, it's actually true. Um, and then they basically made themselves very much at home um, and headed straight for the kitchen and started making themselves pasta. So I had one chopping onions and one boiling water and, uh, and I just remember thinking, the Clash are cooking pasta in my kitchen. <laughs> Soho. Yeah. I mean, back in the day. Yeah. It was back in the day, it was a it was a really trendy bar. It was called the Fix. F I X X. So um, the Fix was the first place they actually did a gig. That was the first place that you know I saw them coming to life. For me, it's so significant because even though I was hanging about with them, I I didn't know I hadn't heard them play yet. So yeah. this was this is the yeah, show. and there's all there's been a lot of sort of humming and hawing and yeah. and a bit you know little bits of tension and indecisions and thing and I, and things and I suppose for me it all just came came to life here and you know we started playing. I just by the time you got here, you're kind of you're on the road with the clash. Well, I suppose that, that I was still pinching myself the whole time that it was sort of happening. Looking across at what was the rock garden. Right. Um, so the rock garden was the second place that I went down to with the clash um, on the Wednesday night because they wanted to try and organise a gig for the next day there, which is what happened. So we came down here and they got the boys got quite a few free beers and they organised to play there the next day at three o'clock and uh, they played down in the basement um, and it was in incredible. So it was quite a small place so you had people standing in the chairs and you know people like just absolutely jammed. So even without mobile phones word had got round. Uh, uh, it really it had. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I just you know I've got a sort of mental image of all these phones ringing off the hook and yeah. You know, just everybody phoning everybody else, and uh, yeah, word got around. Who needed mobile phones? It still happens. In fact, today it could never have happened. It would just have been too much. It would just have been impossible. So, in a way, yeah, it just would it simply would have happened. Be doing that I know exactly. But I've got a fantastic memory actually of of this particular gig down the stairs um, with Strummer, who again he'd been very quiet at that particular point, um, I think there was something, I can't remember what was going on, but there was something really had been bugging him and, uh, and he was being quite sort of grumpy and grouchy um, and then he got on stage and again it was just, he just completely lit up, um, came to life and he was dancing, they were actually dancing on top of um, the, the tables, he actually fell back at some point and, and fell like on me yeah. and, oh, wow. and to sort of like help him back yeah. up on stage and he still was gracious enough to uh, turn around and apologise and the other fantastic thing was um, that he got, uh, jumped up on the, he was up on the table and he got one of the spotlights that were up on the, on the ceiling and he actually turned the spotlight so it was lighting up the whole band which I thought, you know, how cool is that? He knew exactly what he was doing and the place just was going wild.
Oh, Gillian, now we're outside the aptly named The Rogue, but <laughs> Duke, back, yeah. back in the day yeah. it was Duke's. It was, it was uh, called Duke's Bar and it was a, a really fantastic little sort of western themed bar um, and the owner of Duke's was famously a huge Clash fan um, and when word got to him that they were in town um, he offered the, the band uh, free mescal all night to oh play so how could they possibly uh, refuse so that by when they played here it was the Thursday night so it was the last evening they played in Glasgow we came from Woodland Road in the afternoon and we came up here and I remember them playing drums in the taxi and singing what I think was summertime blues and me sitting in the middle thinking this is just I have to store this mental image forever but actually the bar inside um, is, is very small so there was really a, a, a limit to the number of people that, that were able to get in and they did what they want and the band all came out and played to this massive yeah. people who had but found out where they were they just uh, they played just they were standing down there just where I suppose there was a bit more space for yeah. people around there and there was just a huge crowd of people watching them playing there and it was just yeah I did know this was going to be the last place that they played yeah. in their wee busking tour of Glasgow because um, we'd set it up the day before so um, what we did was we came in here for lunch actually the day before um, so that's why we're, we're in here, this is the Vic uh, what used to happen was there would be a big buffet uh, set all the way down uh, what is now the bar right. there and people would just come and get their plates and fill up as they went along but of course the guys didn't have any money um, but even the, the little Irish woman called Mona, who was uh, a force to be reckoned with, she, she knew who they were. Yeah. And, um, really? Uh, she, of course, yeah. everybody, well, the word had got out, so yeah. everybody kind of knew what was going on. So it was, yeah, it was amazing walking in and just seeing people's responses as they sort of looked and then looked again and, you know, the, the realisation came over them. So now we're upstairs in the school, yep. uh, and this is the place they actually play. This is the hall, and behind us is the stage, it as is. it indeed was. Yeah, exactly the same as it was, pretty much. Okay, what was the atmosphere like? Unbelievable. It was just so full, people clambering in the door to try and get in. Surreal, I think, is the word I would use. And, and what were the audience like? Are they... Oh, I mean, so, so loud, so yeah. loud. I could yeah. hear what the Clash were playing, but I heard afterwards that apparently you couldn't hear a lot of what was being played just because of the, the volume of noise of people cheering and singing That's along, singing. Yeah. of course, because everybody, they were so massive at the time, everybody yeah. knew all the words of all the songs, and um, one of the um, lasting memories, abiding memories, is of Pete Howard, the drummer, playing um, the drums on a plastic chair, on the back of the chair, the handle of the yeah. chair probably had another chair beside him and uh, just he was just hammering the hell out of this chair and I, I think probably to try and make, generate a noise above yeah. the, the, the crowd. How many people were on the stage apart from the band and you? That was it. That was it. It was just. So it, but you, was, you were in the clash? Yeah, yeah, I was, yes, I was, uh, I wouldn't say backing singer but I was certainly uh, smiling away happily in the background, trying not to be too obvious. I don't think anybody, and nobody would have noticed me anyway. I was just sitting up the back of the stage, just watching it all unfold. So, how long did they play for? Um, I think they played about five songs. Right. And then they were um, they straight out of here. And they were pretty much straight out of here. I was still with them then, so I had to take them down to the train station yeah. because I think they were going. Well, they were going to Manchester. We were going to Manchester, yeah. but as you say, they never they played play. there. Uh, but we, we stopped for a curry <laughs> on the way down, so that just was their way of saying thanks to yeah. me for putting them up for, for a couple of nights, which I thought was really sweet having curry with the clash. Just trying to hold on to every second of memory because I knew that yeah. in an hour that was it, they'd be gone and it would all be like a dream. But there was already sort of you could tell there was tensions and there was a lot of people wanting to do, well, there was some of them were wanting to do one thing and you know yeah. then there was a lot of indecision and um, when I look back, now that I know what I know now, yeah. when I look back it did really, it, it did have a sense of something that was coming to an end. Yeah. You know I didn't obviously know that at the time. I think Strummer, he did seem quite distant from the whole thing and um, 
he just didn't seem in a happy space yeah. until he was on stage and then, and then, and then oh, it, it really was incredible yeah. the difference he was just a born, born entertainer. Fantastic. Seventeenth of May. I don't know what to say or where to begin. How depressing to think of normal life after two days like that. Maybe it was my long-awaited gift. It certainly blew all my anxieties to the wind. So I should write it down now, so I won't forget any of it. But I've just come from the station, and a big soppy farewell as they were off to Manchester. Even Joe gave me a big kiss. He was the only one that kept his distance from mostly everyone. The times when I could forget who they were were the best. This morning at 3 a.m. I wondered whose floor they'd be crashed on tonight. Oh, I hope those photos turn out. The clash getting up and organised in the morning. One of the few times I caught Joe in any form of a good mood, dancing to Route 66 before leaping into action. I told Stephen Hay all about it. He's the only one so far who seems to realise how phenomenal the whole thing was to me. He said I should write it all down. Well, we're on the farm after all, right? We need some ginger pie, so we have to do the Than the rest of them. 
be having been stuck in a wall for about 20 years. <laughs> So, um, update. So what we did was we, we showed the film in one of the venues that was referred to there, Dukes. And I think um, the, the interactive documentary is going to be redone, but what is interesting really is that the, the feedback has really come not in this great new world from online networks and stuff. It's actually really been word of mouth that's come out of actually screening the film. So we had one screening in um, what was what was uh, what, what's now renamed Dukes, and much more recently in the one you saw called Matt's Barn Grill, which uh, was known as the Rock Garden. And um, the feedback has been incredible, really. They've also been kind of very, very emotional experiences. Um, the, there were two screenings in, in the Rock Garden. Um, this, the second one, in particular, uh, being attached to this. I don't know if you've heard of this, but jo the, the Joe Strummer Foundation is a charity which essentially uh, has these uh, jamming gigs, uh, passes around the ball, collects money, and the center of its, uh, its aim is to buy musical instruments which are then taken into prisons and given to prisoners to, um, for them to, to, to use and, and learn music. Now, the the film it will be recut again. Um, you have some of the busking music, I guess you will recognize that it's extremely lo-fi and you'll see from the credits. That actually came from a recording that was made in Gateshead outside, uh, outside a pub. Um, and at the last screening that I attended in Glasgow, um, not just Gillian kind of introduced it, but there were three or four guys who were also there who actually seemed to follow them around every gig in Glasgow there. And a guy called Derek, who joined it, seemed to tell everyone else, is it okay if I you know, come up and talk? And he went up and he started immediately talking about the recording he made of the Glasgow School of Art gig, which, which as far as we have been able to ascertain, is the last time they played with The Clash. They were scheduled to play in Manchester. I think whether it was the police stopped the whole thing, the word had got out, but they certainly didn't play in Manchester. And they were scheduled to uh, play in a couple of festival things in Europe and didn't turn up. But he made these recordings and he produced the CDs and for all their lo-fi, you know, he, he dropped this, this tape deck down. They are much, much, much better quality than the Gateshead and the street recordings. So we're going to reintroduce that to the film, um, though it will not be much, much longer. It will, it will be probably very close to the, close to the same line. Um, what has come out, the, 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 aim, the aim of course of the interactive documentary is, is to share this thing with those who were on the busking tour. The busking tour was, um, they were in Nottingham, they turned up at the University of Leeds. Um, George Thomas here was died right there apparently after getting red paint thrown at them by the alarm who were playing an official gig in, in the Leeds University Union and had to deal with a clash coming up outside. I don't think it was deliberate sabotage, but um, they played York. And I've just been notified of a, a new cafe in New York, which is open with a kind of full length, full height photograph taken of the Clash bus scene in the middle of New York. Uh, I suspect I know the image, though. But I'll be curious to see the, the one and only image that ever seems to turn up at the beginning in New York. Um, then uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow, and, and that, that was it. The, the photographs in the rock garden, which, which you can see, are not properly scanned. They were sent, taken with a mobile phone, stuck his prints on the wall. I just slammed them in there to, 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 to do this, this viewing. Um, just came out at the last minute from someone who, again, who, who heard about this, this film and was there at the time. Um, yeah, so, yes, um, I think I've done quite enough here in terms of taking up your time, so I'm not happy to answer any questions. I'll have a question. Yeah. Uh, Julia said, I think you said originally she was a friend of your sister's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she said, reading out in the diary, I have told Stephen Hay about this. Why, why, why did she, why did she think you would be 
interested, or, or why were you interested in 1985? No more the fact that, you know, I, I wasn't Clash fan number one, but uh, the way I would put it is, you know, the people I was with well, think we all like the Clash to an, to an extent. She was a huge Clash fan. I think I, I knew her really very well, you know, um, through my sister, and um, she didn't think I was going to do anything with it. There was there was no question of me, you know, turning it into a project. It was it was literally just a story in the pub. That that's really all it was. It was nothing nothing more than that. Yeah. What makes it interactive when it exists online? Yeah, well, the idea is that people can then, they can contribute as to, you know, they can, they can pull stuff down, they can even re-edit stuff, they can insert their own pictures, they can add things, they can, they can um, you know, use maps and locations to actually uh, document in a little bit more detail the entire tour, because this is, this is of course, just Glasgow, and the plan is really to expand it out of Glasgow. So will they then re-upload that stuff? Yeah, for... yeah. Because there, there must be some, there has to be some more material yeah. uh, out there. So would you combine it into a kind of master edit at some point, or just let various versions? I, I, I'll probably be chased to, to produce a, one more version of this at least, and I think I'm done, because I only want to, to do the, the... I don't want to start finding myself making sort of several different films. Gillian telling her story is just is, is, yeah. is the film I decided to make with some students. Yeah. And so I won't take it further than that. Yeah, she's very engaged. I mean, it's, I, I find it quite difficult. There's, um, um, in there? Yeah, let's just show you this picture. Um, so, if I just expand that slightly. So, I, I, one of the other interviews I did was with Gillian having a conversation with this guy. This guy's called Andy Scott. Andy Scott is a he's a sculptor with metal. He's now he's a very very big figure in Scotland. He does he does public art all over the world. His most famous in Scotland is probably the Kelpies, and you've heard of their huge horse heads in um, central Scotland uh, near Stirling Falter. And he's actually got one in Brigitte in Leeds, which is quite typical of his work. Um, so he was, he was there, and we, because she knew, she still was in contact with him, there was the first kind of other, other recording we did, which was her in conversation with him. And, it, and it's interesting, and it's a, it's a few minutes of, which brings out a little bit more about what the what the event meant to other people. Um, <laughs> interestingly, his, his comments about the, out, out of the three years he, he did at Glasgow School, that the only thing he thought was really important was the date clash date. Um, but it didn't fit. It somehow, as you can see, the, the story is just Gillian telling a story. It doesn't try to expand out, and actually it became a bit awkward trying to drop this in. And um, in terms of getting the, the story out there, and trying to you know, attract people's attention, see if we can get more you know, feedback and feed into it. Um, you know, Gillian's quite keen to use the fact that he is very, very well known, that he has his own huge networks, and, he's, and he, he himself is very you know, fond and attached to the story, but it doesn't really work inside the documentary. You can't really cut it in, it doesn't, it doesn't but quite you could fit. have a place where you have um, mm. people's stories, mm. that's quite fun. That but all I had, all I had initially was Gillian's photographs, yeah. nothing else. The, that's the ones inside the flat. These ones came out just a, a couple of days before the very first screening. Um, this handful of rather, I, I do love these pictures outside the school of art. Um, yeah. I have another question. Yeah. Um, Gillian was asking about the fact that um, and the Manchester Free Trade Hall, Bob Dylan said, do you know yeah. people pretended that they were on, that they went to yeah. Glasgow School of yeah. Art to say yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Surely. Yeah. Um, first, I really enjoyed that. Um, mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what you'll do with the additional things that you get, whether they're photos or stories, and if you'll keep it as like interactive online, or if you're thinking of doing like archives or an exhibit or sort of what how much material do you think is out there what else may you do besides the documentary i mean i i don't feel terribly well qualified to answer that one properly because <laughs> i'm i'm not handling the interactive documentary okay. and that's that's graham's kind of research field kind of post in the international in, in interactive documentary um the, the yeah the plan is just to let people contribute and try and as far as is legally possible, not overmanage that. 
it, it is about, in a sense, facilitating people sharing this thing. It's, it's actually been tremendously moving. Um, for it, I don't know, who's a clash fan here? I mean, who's... <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I know. It, it's, just give a sense of, when you, when you listen to what... George Thomas is one of these, these people that is incredibly fondly held. The guys of the band themselves, there's an incredible fondness uh, about this guy and his, his kind of positivity, which is kind of um, quite a kind of contrast to the kind of nihilism of, of the, the, the pistols, the kind of uh, Johnny Rotten as he was back then, the kind of reverse of that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really about letting people kind of share that experience and um, yeah, so we plan to expand it. But I think that's kind of the, perhaps the problem of, you know, whenever people talk about the clash or the pistols, they seem to focus on one person from the group. Yes. So any conversation about the clash yeah. very rapidly moves from the conversation about a band that all contributed towards yeah. the sound and the production values yeah. and the, yeah. to one person. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a real issue there with the way that historians document histories of popular music. Yes. Yes. Um, and that's something that, that you know, I'm not a historian, but I think it, there's a danger there that it becomes really, really narrow. Yeah. Um, I know, I heard a really interesting program yesterday on Radio 6. It was talking to Joe Strummer's wife, and she's in the process of releasing a number of acoustic, non acoustic, some rare material yeah. that he had here. Yeah. Apparently, he's got this huge yes. catalog of stuff that he didn't even release. Or, sure. you know, and he's obviously a prolific songwriter. Yeah. Um, and again, it was the, the conversation moved from the clash to him in, 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 a, in a very, very yeah. So I'm always, yeah. I mean, I was never a big fan of the Clash, but, and less so Joe Strum, to be fair. But, um, yeah, I, I think what I'm trying to make is a document the history of which this is part of that. I mean, what I liked about it was actually speaking to the witnesses rather than the protagonists. Yeah. Um, and the lady there seemed to very much talk about it in terms of a band rather than just about Joe Strum. Yeah, I think that's just really important that that's maintained throughout that sort of idea of documenting history. It, it's sort of what I, I, I want to try and do is to try and really make this about people's experience of it rather than not some you know, authoritative history. Um, and you remind me of another aspect of this that it, this is actually this is a kind of controversial piece of clash history. This was there was the couple of original members of the band were kicked out, and you see talking about a band that's on the road. With a, with a uh, in the actually I don't know this was the album released yet I think it was about to be released so they're about to release a dreadful album actually uh, and the story was a vandalised album um, they've got three new uh, guitarists and, and so it's a kind of it's been kind of written out of Clash history as though this is not really the Clash and I can I can fully understand fully understand that this lineup never produced uh, an album that really sold it was regarded as really worthy of what. But you get no sense of that whatsoever from the people who were there with the remnants of the original class, Strummer and Simon, and these three hungry young guys who are giving it their all. They were, and the the new recordings we got, uh, even handing on CDs, this guy that they were playing in the car after they did, were tremendously exciting. I mean, acoustic guitars. Fairly, fairly bad recording and literally you know, sticks on whatever hard surface you've got. And yet, it's incredibly exciting and energetic stuff, yeah. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.